Hi, everybody. Welcome as you're joining us. And thank you for um, your patience and grace with our human error oversight and not sending you the Zoom link until two or three minutes after our event was supposed to start. Um, I feel like we're in a safe space of people now realizing that they've been there perhaps in the past 24 hours or the past week. I will ask you as you're joined to please um, make sure your mic is muted and turn off your video for the first portion of our event just so that we can um, make sure that we feature our panelists front and center as we don't have the webinar function uh, activated for this particular event. And in the interest of time and hearing from the brilliant women you see in front of you today, I'll get started as we are, um, as we are welcoming people into the space. So hi everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, a little a couple minutes behind schedule. My name is Laura DeVoe, and for those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, um, welcome. I'm the founder and executive director of Women Who Lead. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Women Who Lead, we're a volunteer led organization with a mission to passionately engage, educate and equip women leaders with the skills they need uh, for career advancement and leadership if that is what they aspire to. The content that we offer as a network um, is really in line with what we hear from our community around uh, what it is that they identify as gaps and what it is that they feel will help them move forward in their careers. Today's conversation uh, is sort of close to my heart and one that I'm quite excited about around values. And when I connected with our three panelists in our uh, pre-event pre call, um, it really bottom lined for me around my personal journey, um, Selena sort of solidified for me that it's it's been an experience of navigating the tensions that come up between values that may have been given to us somewhere along the way and the ones that we actually want to choose for ourselves, the ones that are true to us. And as we jump into this topic, um, again, my personal reflections, not speaking on behalf of the panel, um, what's, what strikes me is that we've been socialized often in the way we communicate to um, communicate what we do, our titles, the nature of our work, and not why we do it. And that's really um, the spirit behind this topic today. Uh, and that's the essence of who we are. And if you've watched Simon Sinek's TED Talk on how great leaders inspire action or read the book, Start With Why, this is what got me started on this journey. And you'll probably have an idea of what I'm talking about. So as we go through today's event, um, I encourage you to take a moment and reflect on what you want the story of your uh, career to be, or even your story more broadly. And how well does that line up with the way that you speak about yourself or the way that you would describe where you're at now? Because stories matter. They allow us to hold on to the important parts of things. They allow us to filter out what's trivial and find a pattern in everything. And anchoring our story around values is the key to making sure that that pattern is meaningful and one that energizes us instead of one that drains us. And one of the great things about this is that you're both the main character and the narrator of your professional story. So while you don't control every circumstance, which I'm sure we might get into today, you'll always be in control of how you tell that story. And today's event in part is about helping you get clearer on the story you want to tell. And you may hear from our panelists a little bit about how they've done that themselves. So I'll encourage you um, at least for our time together today and, and hopefully after to not let what you're good at or what others expect of you to define who you are or what's possible. So hopefully you can, you can look beyond and this is going to be an extremely cheesy reference that um, speaks to my life circumstances right now. I often think of Dora the Explorer, which is a show that my kids like to watch. Um, and it's really around trying to set aside that ideal of a straight line and walk that meandering path and see what's possible and what comes up for you if you're not so fixated on that efficiency of moving forward. So with that being said, um, it's time to introduce today's panel. And in the true spirit of women who lead and today's topic, I'll give them each a few minutes um, for their own brief introduction, since they are the narrators of their own story. And you can read um, much about their bios online if you're looking for more, more details. So I'll start with the top of my screen. Quinn, we'll come over to you first. Thanks so much, Laura. Hi, everyone. It's great to see these little black squares with all your names in them. Um, so many people are in attendance. So I really appreciate you all coming out and 
you know, hearing us share our stories today. My name is Quinn. Um, I'm the director of the Center for Global eHealth Innovation at the University Health Network. We're a research group um, that builds digital therapeutics for chronic disease management. I also teach over at the University of Toronto um, as an assistant professor in the health informatics research program. I want to keep my intro pretty brief um, so that we have more time for discussion, but I see actually a lot of my team members um, who are on this call, so I just wanted to say hi to all of them, but I'll go ahead and pass it over. Thanks, Quinn. Selena, over to you. Hi there, my name is Selena Caesar Chavan. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm speaking you today to you today from my home in Whitby, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island, Williams Treaty Territory. I'm currently the senior advisor for equity at Queen's and adjunct lecturer actually at Queen's University. And um, to keep in the tradition of what we're talking about today, our values, um, when we talk about equity, I don't just do that job. I do that job part-time intentionally. I've been asked to stay as a permanent, a full-time person at Queen's University. I do it intentionally part-time because I believe in the work that we're doing around equity. And if I were to get comfortable and be part of full-time there, I wouldn't believe in our capacity to actually have equity and justice in spaces. So I don't want to ever get comfortable. I want them to always think that, you know, they don't need me, which in fact, most organizations, if they really think about decisions that they make, don't need a senior advisor on equity. And um, I center a lot of my work in empathy. I'm currently doing my PhD looking at uh, in neuroscience, looking at the intersection of empathy and equity. And that is because I am actually a, a Chopra certified um, health instructor. And I believe in the uh, Ayurvedic principle, as is the microcosm, so is the macro. So we need to change ourselves um, and how we think about the world, how we think about our very wicked problems in order to be able to do that with everything else around us. And I'll leave um, time for any questions or a discussion to answer any other questions that you have about me. So thank you. Thanks, Selena. Shalu. Hi, everybody. So uh, happy that you joined us today for this discussion. Uh, my name is Shalu Baines. I have a background and extreme passion uh, in data and analytics and healthcare. I've been in this space for 17 years plus. I identify myself as a South Asian woman. I'm a Bollywood enthusiast. I have a, a smart, bright, spunky, soon to be eight year old daughter. And I'm a proud employee and senior leader at Trillium Health Partners, a large community hospital in Mississauga and West Toronto. And I've been here for 12 years and I've had the opportunity and privilege to be in, a, in many various roles here at, at Trillium. But currently I am the vice president of performance and business intelligence. And I have the great opportunity to oversee a talented and skilled team across business intelligence, data governance, uh, reporting and analytics and integrated planning um, using a variety of data sets, but one of my most favorites um, and passion in population health and patient segmentation to better improve health and healthcare uh, service access in our community. So pleasure to meet all of you. Excellent. So a couple, uh, now that we have a few more of you that have landed in our space, just a couple of reminders. We'll ask you to keep your microphones muted and your videos off uh, for the first portion of our panel conversation today. So about maybe 50-ish minutes so that we can reserve some time for questions given our late start. Uh, and then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. Um, feel free to be active in the chat, both with each other and um, the panelists sort of may drop in and comment and it'll be a fairly organic flow from there. Uh, with that being said, I will jump in for our first question, um, which is a, an intentionally high level one around what does it mean to live your values uh, and how did your upbringing impact those values? And Quinn, we'll start with you. All right, so when, when we had sort of our prep call to think through how to answer these questions, um, after the call, I did reflect on, you know, what does it really mean to live in your values? and and how does your upbringing sort of contribute to that? And so I thought at a high level, I would share the value first and then sort of speak to the journey that I took to sort of get there and how it affects the work that I do and who I am, I suppose, as a person. And I think up until maybe 
like six months ago, I actually didn't know the English word for this value and I often forget it. And so I have written it down and I'm going to read the exact definition for it. So the value that I wanted to talk about today um, was filial piety, which is a totally different word actually in Vietnamese. It's much shorter, but the definition um, for filial piety is the attitude of obedience devotion and care towards one's parents and elders that is the basis of individual moral conduct and social harmony. Um, and so that's a pretty academic definition for that term and sort of to ground it in, I guess, the experience of how that value has affected my life. Um, so I'm Vietnamese Canadian. I was born in Vietnam and my parents um, came to this country uh, very much with with nothing. So with the intention that they could build a better life for me, they were academics in Vietnam and they really gave up that career um, to move here with very little idea, I think, of what they wanted to pursue in Canada. Um, they just sort of aspired to something better than what they had in their home country. And I think that decision was very much motivated by a belief that my future could be brighter if I was Canadian. Um, and so I think I spent a lot of my life watching my parents go through this journey of being immigrants um, and trying to find their Canadian identity and sort of by proxy, me trying to figure out what that meant for myself. And so I grew up in a multi-generational household. Um, I spoke Vietnamese for, for the majority of my youth, the traditions and the, you know, the culture that I was born into and that I spent a lot of my um, life growing into were, were very Vietnamese cultures and traditions. And something that's very, that resonates a lot in, in Vietnamese communities, I would say maybe broadly Asian communities is the sense of, I suppose, adoration or obedience or um, the sense that you owe your elder something that you want to please them. Um, you want to live your life in a way that reflects how they see what they see as being good. And so this was something that I, I wouldn't necessarily say struggled with, but was something that I always had in the back of my mind as I tried to find my way um, as, as someone who wasn't really Vietnamese because I came here quite young and so wanted to fit in. Um, and I think that is a story that many of us um, can, can share which is sort of feeling like we want to carve out a path for ourselves that is a little bit different from those around us, but also just wanting to sort of be the same as everyone else because it's a little bit easier. Um, and so I think in my journey to find out, I, I suppose, like my, my truth or what was authentic to me, I did spend a lot of time not doing the things that my parents told me to do, um, which is, I suppose, in direct conflict to filial piety of trying to um, break away from what these things that they were teaching me that didn't really have what I perceived to be any factual basis. Um, so, you know, the, the selection of certain careers as being better than others. Um, this an, another value of humility always being um, always trying to, to shine or be the best, but never being able to own up to that. So sort of sort of at the same time, um, trying to exceed everyone's expectations, but then never being able to sort of feel proud of it because pride is actually not really that desirable um, in my community. And then at, at the end of the day, sort of, sort of tying all that back to, does it make my parents happy? And so that I think pulling from parents beyond that to looking at just elders and looking at um, people that I've worked for across my career, that's definitely been something that continues to motivate me, the sense of wanting to sort of please others. Um, and that's something that I feel can be good or bad. I think as, as I've tried to progress in my career, I've sort of come to terms with that it's okay, certain things that motivate you, that they don't necessarily have to be good or bad, they can just sort of be, um, and to sort of be okay with whatever makes you motivated to do your work. Um, but I think now in my role, um, as the sort of the academic lead of this research group, I try to, I have, I have found that a lot of the, the ways that I am able to, to behave as a leader 
actually are very similar to how my parents have sort of led me throughout my life. You know, this concept of humility, which was so difficult for me to sort of achieve when I was younger, um, is, is a good trait to have, I think, in a leader. And the perhaps the desire to please others, sort of, you know, flipping that around a bit, the ability, the feeling of being accountable to your staff, of being accountable to the projects you work on, um, of wanting others to, to see you and, and feel like you're someone that they can trust. Um, those things have, have become increasingly important for me. Um, and I also think that the work that I pursue now, which I think we can get into in, in a little bit, I, I think often about my parents when, when I um, work in digital health, um, because they are, they're sort of the, a, a type or a, a trait of person, um, a type of Canadian that is often left behind in, in the services that we provide. And so I often reflect on, does the work that I do, can it benefit my parents? Would they be proud of me? Um, would they see this work as something that was of value to, to them and to the community where I grew up? Um, and so I want to leave space for our other two speakers, but that's sort of the reflections I had around this, this notion of filial piety and how it's played out um, in my own career and in my own life. Thanks, Quinn. Shalu, over to you. Thank you. I'm gonna gonna build off of of Quinn. Um, when I was asked to to speak about this topic, you know, there was a statement that kind of uh, resonated with me about the intersect of values and passion, and and you know, it, I I wanted to start off with that. Like for me, you know, values ignite passion, and and passion ignites your your values. Um, you know, uh, similar kind of similar story to Quinn. Um, I grew up as the oldest girl in a South Asian home in the 80s and the outskirts of the GTA. Lots of expectations and ad idealism to to live up to. But uh, through that uh, experience, you know, the values of loyalty and responsibility were were given to me. Um, and, uh, and they became, they became instilled to me and, and they became my core values. And through that, I kind of became the trusted one in the family. And that's kind of followed me along in my career path as well. Often with being the trusted one with a core value of loyalty and responsibility, you know, you are constantly balancing that tension of people pleasing and uh, and or versus seeking the truth and and I've had to navigate that quite a bit in in my career and I've had to do that by like stepping back and thinking about you know what's what's important to me um, what's my role in that in the situation at hand how can I add value to the situation and and how can I be true to myself and uh, and through through that, I think I have chosen values of of truth and uh, integrity to my innate core values that were that were given to me of of loyalty and responsibility. And having that value of of truth has helped me overcome the the people pleasing aspect that sometimes can come with with that sense of responsibility and loyalty that that uh, you get in growing up in an immigrant family. Um, I've had to use that uh, quite a bit uh, in my in my career of in healthcare analytics. Um, specifically, it's kind of helped me create a, a role um, in in healthcare analytics, where initially was it was dominated by clinicians, and have had to use that sense of responsibility, loyalty, um, and and truth and integrity to to kind of create a space in, in this career. Um, I'll end up on this question with a bit of a story from my perspective. I, I grew up um, very, very close to my maternal maternal grandmother, and she instilled in me the, the Hindu doctrine of, of um, if you fulfill your many hats that you play in, a, in your life, and as women, we, we do as, you know, mothers, partners, uh, workers, uh, you know, sisters, aunts, what have you. And if you fulfill your role, you know, you will feel fulfilled itself. Or if you fulfill your dharma, you'll have good karma. And this has guided me a lot in balancing the tensions of, of my values that were given to me versus um, the, the ones that I have chosen and kind of help me uh, live my values uh, day in and day out. 
Thanks, Shalu. And as we go to Selena, Selena, you can obviously take this in whatever direction you want. One of the things that um, we had reflected on as a, as a group when we met before is that, you know, we're in a position now where we're sort of naming our values, but that was a process. Like it took time to figure out like what, what is the word or words? And um, so just acknowledging that perhaps the conversation goes there, but Selena, I know you've spent um, a lot of time and, and have sort of written a book outlining the journey that got you to that place. So happy to hear um, your thoughts either on the original question or taking it in a direction that perhaps speaks to the journey of connecting with and identifying those values. So yeah, I appreciate that. So thank you. Um, and. I will build off of the previous two speakers, but I'll go in a different direction because I immigrated to Canada when I was two years old and I was left back home with my uh, paternal grandmother. And so I didn't have my, I didn't live with my parents for the first two years. And so there's a different sort of tension that already exists in that narrative. And then, you know, we, I get here as the only girl um, of immigrant parents. We came from Grenada. Grenada has a population less than the size of Whitby. I was a member of parliament for Whitby. So clearly I could be the prime minister of Grenada, but I digress. Um, so when I got here, then you hear these things that, you know, you know, you should kind of people please, but you should be seen and not heard. You need to work twice as hard. You need to work twice as fast because you're in this big country and you're, you have two strikes against you. You're a woman and you're black. And so all of this like pressure is like, you know, like everybody relax. Like I haven't even started anything yet. So you have all these pressures. And then of course you are given five jobs that you could do doctor, lawyer, um, whatever the five are. I don't know. Everybody has, them. I think when they're immigrants, there's like certain things that you could do and there's certain things that you can't do. And I picked doctor. And unfortunately, when I picked doctor, that is the only thing that I knew. I didn't know anything else, but to be a doctor and more specifically, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. So all this is building up to me failing out of university. So I took six years to finish a three-year degree. I graduated with a 1.58 GPA. And when you get a 1.58 GPA, there's no way that you could be a doctor of any kind, let alone a neuro neurosurgeon. And that was the moment where my life completely crashed, but it also turned because I had to figure out how I was going to do something and I didn't even know that there's anything else that you could do in science, right? Because you didn't even explore it. I didn't explore anything else. So how to figure out what you could do with your life if you don't have, if your degree is not worth the paper that it's printed on. And so I say that because one of the, the values that I live by or one of the definitions of leadership that I live by is transformative leaders, leadership. And it was given by uh, Dr. Carolyn Shields. And she said, transformative leaders requires a leader to have a clear sense of their values and belief that undergird his or her or their own identity, be willing to take stands that require moral courage, live with tension and engage in activism and advocacy. And so even though I had this sort of tension tense upbringing um, in which my values may have shifted of, of what I thought was success, what I thought was important, the foundation which my parents had built for me, the, the, the kind of resilience, the kind of passion, the kind of um, dogged determinant was already there. That is the foundation on which I stood on and I, I continue to stand on. Where it shifted for me, um, not so much during my entrepreneurship years or during politics, was after politics where you, you again start to think about, okay, what does it mean to live by your values? And when you grow up being told that you need to follow the rules, you need to be seen and not heard, you need to be happy that you have a seat at the table, me telling off a prime minister is not what my parents want me to do. Like it's the absolute worst possible. And we don't even talk about the incident because it is not what you're supposed to do. However, I have also um, followed a lot of great philosophers and, and business sort of leaders and Clayton Christensen, who was a Harvard professor, he died a few months ago in his essay, How Will You Measure Your Life? And I'll put the essay in the chat in a little bit. He says that the lesson I learned from this is that it's easier to hold 
your principles 100% of the time than it is to hold them 98% of the time. If you give in to just this once, just this once I'm gonna cheat, just this once I'm gonna not do what I'm saying I'm supposed to do based on a marginal cost analysis, you will regret where you end up. You have to define for yourself what you stand for and draw a line in a safe space. And I, I, I say that because at the moment that I left politics, even though I knew it was disruptive and that it will cause tension with family, it will cause tension with community, I knew that I could not look myself or my children in the eye if I did not stand up during that moment. And I knew based on this essay that it was easier to hold on to those values that I held really dear um, 100% of the time and know that I was standing on the right side of history, even if I was standing alone, than to waver in those values. And um, for me, when I think about it, I think about it in this way, and I'll close with this that I'm a disruptor and I use my values and my principles to anchor that disruption. And I don't disrupt to break, I disrupt to make better. And so my parents came here and they took a risk. I'm sure people in Grenada were like, why do you need to leave Grenada? It's so nice, it's hot, we have mango, we have like beaches, why would you go to Canada? And they must've thought you're such a disruptor, like why can't you just stay here and be nice and quiet like everybody else? And they decided to go. That is the risk, that is the disruption that they took to come here to make a better life for their children. I am here. And so when people say, well, why would you disrupt? Why, why, are, you, why are you constantly picking out the government? Why are you constantly trying to you know, break glass ceilings and bend status quo? It is because I am here and I need to make here better for my children. And so when we think about our values, they, they can shift, but the foundation of those values have always remained constant. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much, um, Selena. I'll offer a, a brief um, reflection on my own journey in case it's helpful for, for those of you before we segue to our next question. Um, I imagine it will resonate with a few of you that there have been multiple points in my life, and I'm sure there will be more again, where I have a, have a thought of like, what am I doing? This just feels like you know, the grocery basket that you can't make a meal from, um, like there's no common thread here, there's no cohesion, like what is my story? Who am I? Um, and the, the, those used to come up quite predictable, like every sort of six months I would feel that way because in between I get caught in the status quo of, you know, as a scientist, like academic outputs or, or what have you, whatever my role was at the time. And it took a couple of iterative cycles of sitting down um, and saying so in advance process first and I think it was um, Suda that put this in the chat I'm I identified I think you're frozen Laura you're coming in and out oh you're definitely frozen I did um, while Laura unfreezes, I think we should probably go on with the show. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, is she back? That's just strains me. Like, what do I wish I? Um, and usually, there's a values con. Oh, no. Okay, our internet is gone. <laughs> So how about I ask the second question then, and I'll direct it to Shalu. Yeah. Is that okay? Um, I'm, do. Also, I'm also happy to answer. There was a question in the chat for me. Should I leave that at the end? Um, yeah, so we'll just go in the order that yeah. we did, and then we'll leave that up to the end. Yeah, in the in the chat. Do you, is that okay? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it says, how does an equity lens intersect with your value-driven approach? Oh, this is an excellent question and definitely one that I've had to uh, reflect on as I go through my own like learning and, and, and unlearning in the equity and inclusivity um, um, space. 
Um, for, for me, you know, to, to live my values with an equity lens, it, it really, it really comes down to respecting others and having, um, compassion, um, for, for others. Like practically this is meant whether I'm, you know, I'm, I'm my mother role, wife role, healthcare leader role, or community member, I, I need to step back and take the, the time to understand the, the various perspectives, backgrounds, um, what the person or stakeholder in front of me wants or doesn't want. Um, and before I can even think about solving the issue or, or question at, at hand and in order to support them um, with a solution and respecting that process, I think that is the most truthful to, to my values if I, if I really do take that time to understand that person's perspectives. Um, in my role with uh, data and analytics in healthcare, I often use my values of responsibility and loyalty um, um, towards our, our patients and have often get asked qu uh, questions to quickly find solutions. But I, I you know, I've I have found myself having to step back and encourage my team to step back and understand each and every one of those numbers that we produce, those, those are people, those are patients. And living our, our values and our values at, at Trillium encompass compassion means understanding our patients, um, why they use healthcare services, or more importantly, why some don't use healthcare services and, and support our clinical teams to engage with them and not just react to the data. And uh, I see that as my social responsibility um, in this profession and in a way I live my values um, using an equity lens. I'll turn it back I mean, to you, Laura. I, I'm not really needed anymore, but this is wonderful. Um, I'm just going to stay relatively in the background and, and Selena will come over to you and thank you, um, not surprisingly, for the three of you for making that fairly seamless as my internet kicked me out of our event. No, no problem at all. Um, and uh, like somebody said in the in the chat, uh, Julie said, "This is a women who lead panel, so we're we're cool." Like after this, we'll like you know figure out world problems and we'll solve them. Um, but uh, so when it comes to an equity lens, an, an equity lens um, drives everything that I do, and a, a lens that looks that is intentionally looks at intersectionality around um, that equity component, but more importantly, the step beyond equity is justice. So removing those barriers. Um, so while equity gives people what they need based on their intersecting identities, um, justice removes barriers completely so that we could either make the investment in justice or we can make the investment in equity. And I think we just remove the barriers altogether. And that is, I think, because, um, because of those values. And if I speak to someone else's point in the chat that talked about their values shifting, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember who said it, but um, I think it was Suda who said that, you know, it, your values may shift at some point. Um, usually out of a painful experience. So when I talk about um, empathy, when I talk about how empathy interacts with equity and, and using that empathetic courage to build equitable practices or to build justice, it's usually because of a pain that I felt. It's usually because I, I failed out of university and I thought that the, the that I'd never get a chance at success. I've you know, I've written a whole book describing all of the mistakes I've made, all the hurts that I've had, um, making the feeling that I would be judged by the worst thing that I'd ever that I'd ever done and never get a second chance. The pain of being left behind and, and wishing that somebody would see me. Um, all of those pains allow me to not sympathize with people when I need to push government to do better. I don't sympathize with people. I empathize with them. I know what it feels like to want someone to come and rescue you. I know what that feels like to hurt. And so I don't want people to hurt. And so um, I'm just going to answer the question from Alex that, you know, how do you, how do you deal with circumstances where people view your disruption as, as meant to break and don't see the value in it? They're going to talk about me anyway. As long as I'm talking with passion and conviction and bringing the receipts, they're going to see me as an angry Black woman. So be it. I know that the values that I bring and the reason why 
I push, the reason why I disrupt is because we cannot continue to live by rules that were written when most of us on the screen, most of us women who lead, we're not even in the room. We're living by some unwritten rules or some rules that were never intentionally wanting us to be a part of. I was in parliament from 2015 to 2019. There were no dress code for women. Why? Because women weren't supposed to show up anyways, let alone speak. So they're gonna talk about us anyway. You might as well give them something good to talk about. So to your question, Alex, um, I hope, and I say this to Jane Philpott all the time and, and Jody, um, and not to make everything about politics, because politics is such a small component of my life, but I say to them that, you know, I hope that history is kind to us and they may not see the value in what we did today, but I hope at some point, smarter, brighter people, and I, I don't just wanna say women, but gender diverse individuals would see that value and stand up and know that the value that they have in themselves is so important and therefore an asset to our country, our, our democracy, our world. And so if they don't see it now, I hope history sees it at some point and celebrates it. Thanks, Selena. Um, I'm a little terrified to make a statement longer than five seconds, but we'll see how it goes. Um, one of the things that that struck me in the last few words there was um, that it, you know, history is not an entity in and of itself. There are historians and people who interpret history, and and I think in my speaking only for myself. Um, there is there is an evolution in what it means to be a part of history and how that is experienced and communicated and um, hopefully it's not generations after you but within your own lifetime that you start to see those ripple effects and the waves that are created by um, those painful moments where where you disrupted having faith in the impact that it would have for those that come after you. Um, Quinn, over to you. Thanks, Laura. Some really powerful comments, I think, being shared by both Shalou and Felina. I'm going to just repeat the question again for everyone, mainly because I forgot the original question. Um, and so um, I think question number two was how does an equity lens intersect with your value driven approach? And I think for me, I guess my experience was a little bit different from Selena's that I didn't really recognize that. I didn't really understand, I suppose, the role that equity would play in my life because I never thought about it, about my identity um, and, and this notion of filial piety and how those things actually intersected with the concept of equity. And it was really only, I'll speak to sort of two things. One is sort of my professional career and then the other is just a broad sort of um, a broad approach to how I try to, to live out my values and incorporate equity within that. But I work in, in digital health, which is a, a pretty niche and um, some would argue a very elitist field of creating solutions, health solutions um, that use extremely expensive technologies and services um, to be able for people to be able to benefit from those services. Um, everything about technology, I think if, if you sort of close your eyes and think about what that means, you're going to see sort of, you know, your Facebook CEOs um, and, and just a, a very small slice of, of, you know, a global citizen, people who can benefit from these things. And um, in increasingly in the work that, that we were doing, I felt like I was leaving behind the people that I grew up with in, in the work that I did. And, and so those were my parents. And I also had a very close relationship with my grandmother, um, who pretty much raised me. And so I, that has really changed the work that I do. I think I, I made a very purposeful shift in the portfolios that we were working on um, at work to actually lean into this notion of filial piety. Because if we, if our older ethnic adults couldn't use our solutions, why not develop you know, amendments or enhancements to our solutions that would enable their children, their grandchildren, their sisters, a proxy in their life to be able to use those solutions with them to expand this notion of 
self-management or individual use of these solutions to involve the family. Um, and so that, that to me, that was like a, a very clear translation of sort of this dyadic um, sense of, of how technology should be used. And, and that very much came from this experience of helping my parents use technology, not even health technology, because no health technology has really been made for them or been made for, for us as, as a dyad to use together. But I think more broadly, um, how I suppose equity um, and and this, this notion of filial piety has played out in my own life is that I think the world is increasingly becoming so polar polarizing. If you sort of go on Twitter and on any of these mediums, people have such strong stances and the way that they communicate disagreement to each other is not sometimes can be disrespectful. And, and from my own upbringing, my own culture, I think you can disagree with people's ideas, their actions, but you don't need to disrespect them. You can, and actually, you should try, you know, doing that sort of within an Asian family, try being rude in expressing your disagreement, just sort of see what happens. And, and that, that I didn't know how much of that upbringing and, and what the impact it had on me um, until now when I, I can very clearly see like you can disagree and still be polite and not attack the individual who held that value, a value that was um, in conflict with yours. And, and ultimately, you know, the world, there's within the grays, I suppose, there's, there's nuance. Um, and you can be compassionate and empathetic, um, as Selena was saying, in expressing diverse values. Um, and so that's something that's really helped me to, especially as I um, advance in my career, to, to be able to, to lead in a way that's respectful of others, um, even when we don't always see eye to eye. Thanks, Quinn. I think um, this is going to segue nicely to our third question and some of the comments in the chat. Um, I just want to, and what I'm about to offer, please all of you edit as we go around, but, but values are what matter to you. Like they're the things you can't cross off the list um, in whatever language or verbiage you use to define them. And that is distinct from what is morally right or wrong. Um, and that, that's just what came up for me, Quinn, as you were describing that. And I want to offer, um, Nisha and Alessandra have put some comments in the chat around, they're both in their PhDs and struggling with, um, just trying to find my way back here, like balancing years of experience and the stress and pressures of publishing and long hours and lower compensation. And I won't dive into all those specifically, although like the anxiety from when I was a PhD student is now bubbling up. I'm gonna offer um, one thing and then I'll jump into question three. Um, this is, and this is a, from a very privileged position that I say this, I've decided as a scientist that I don't care what your metrics of success are. So for example, I applied to be associate professor and they told me that my leadership and research productivity was outstanding and I needed to teach more. And I said, if, if where I, if who I am now is not enough for you, I will always be an assistant professor um, because I don't have more to give in the way that you're asking me. Again, I recognize my privilege there, but as I've stepped into a leadership role, I am so cognizant of this that I'm using that position of power to change that and create psychologically safe spaces, I hope, over time um, that start to alleviate this. But what I will say to Alessandra and Nisha and anyone else who feels this way is this system was built by people who didn't have to care for children, who didn't have all of the hats that you have, the, perhaps the caregiving responsibilities, the experiences that have happened in your life. And while, it, while this may only be sort of a balm to soothe things in the moment, um, you are not alone. I imagine everyone on this call right now can think of a time where they have been irritated by um, and hurt by those sort of system pressures. And so as I handed over to Selena for this question, Alessandra, you had said, um, I can't help but think there could be ways to ease these internal struggles. And I just want you and everyone else to know, like, it is not your problem to fix. It is not a problem with you. Um, you know, there, there are system-wide pressures that set this up. So I'll, on that note, I'll frame our next question, but I think all of our panelists will have something to add here. The question was, um, 
we have we had talked in our prep call about unlearning our values um, and how that's shown up for you or how you've approached that. But again, um, as we have so far, feel free to pick up on what resonates most in this conversation. And, and Selena, we'll start with you. So the unlearning, I'll use Alexandra's question and Corey's question to answer that. Um, so when, so me, maybe 20 years ago, I'm almost 50, I'll be 50 in a, in a couple of years, um, uh, answering those questions, I would have said, well, you know, you need to balance or you need to prioritize or you need to do something that keeps both of those your, your common values and your success, however you define it, of your career on two separate scales. Um, me now, so 20 years ago, I would have answered this question completely different. And I, I say my age because, again, I think that my age <clears throat> does identify who I am and where I am in my, my trajectory and my privilege as well. So bear with me as I answer these questions. So 20 years ago, two separate things, I would tell you to balance, prioritize some, some, something that will keep them distinct. Where I am now, and to Corey's point, how do we do this without the pain or um, how do we get there without that pain is I've been through a lot of pain. I constantly have tears right behind my eyeballs. Um, but what I've learned to answer Alexandra's question, is that there is not a balance. And I actually wrote this down because I didn't want to forget. The values live through your success. They, so in other words, they're at the center of it. So your empathy, your truth, your service live in or at the heart of your career, your success. And that's what makes it your dharma. That's what makes it your ikigai. That's what makes it whatever you want to call it, that your passion, that's what makes it that. If it is separate and distinct, then you're probably not in the right place just yet. Understanding that I'm not saying go quit your job or quit your dissertation. And I, I'm actually at the early stages of my PhD as well. And I am petrified because who does that at like almost 50? Like who, who, who decides that they're going to do that? I do. And who decides to do it at Queens looking at the intersection of empathy and equity in a neuroscience program? Because I want to understand whether we could think with our hearts and love with our brains. Like let's do a little something more traditional, Selena, and not so woo. Um, but I'm sticking to that. And so when we think about how that balance happens, it's not a balance, Alexandra. It's an internal component of anything that we do. And so when we, when we have our values as the center of what we define as success, and success for me is not the same as it was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, I would have said prioritize so you can make more money and do whatever. Right now, success for me is just being in joy. When people ask me what I'm doing ne next, I say I'm doing now, next. I live in the present. I'm very aware. I'm very conscious of those kinds of things. So I, I allow my values, my beliefs to be at the center of whatever that success is because I stop and smell the roses every day. And therefore, to Corey's point, the pain is reduced. There's a different set of, it's a different, if it's a different awakening that you have in the morning when you're going to work, I'm gonna use that in quotes because I don't believe that it is actually work. I actually just love everything that I do on a regular basis and live in this joy. Um, but I'm also 48. And so the years of pain that I've experienced, I actually used for good. Because Corey, to your point, that if there's if you feel pain, there has to be another side. Karma dictates that. You have to have an equal and opposite reaction. And if the painful, if the pain was really heavy and hard, then the beauty on the other side where I am right now is magnificent. So. I, a contextual of that with my age so that 
not because you want to, because I want you to experience pain and like you have to wait until you're 48 to like get to the point where the pain is not painful. But nobody ever told me that pain could be used for good. So I'm saying it now so that perhaps you're not taking those painful moments as they are, but sitting and trying to figure out what is the beauty in this pain and how could I use it for good? And how could I use it to, to center my values so that they become the heart of my success? I hope that makes sense. It, it makes complete sense. And I can see Shelly and Quinn smiling. I think there's a, um, there's an unspoken hope wish I think that that the four of us have for everyone attending or everyone that listens to this later on um that we we hope for more for you and it's not that we hope you experience no pain but as to Selena's point we hope that you learn from it we hope that you see the gift that that struggle that burnout um that tension those challenges bring um and that one of the things we had reflected on in our prep call was that, you know, we're all at different ages and stages of our career, but part of the value of this session is, you know, we're open books, like learn from the times that we fell and the times that we couldn't figure it out. Um, and wherever you're starting, um, because that, that is your starting point, wherever it is, is right. It's right for you. Um, that we're, we're hopeful that the pearls that we've picked up along the way um, are in some way, shape or form valuable to you in how you think about carving out a little bit more of that joy. Um, Quinn, we'll come over to you next. I think I have totally lost the third question. So I'm actually just going to react <laughs> to, what, um, to what Selena said, but also I think there was something around unlearning um, unlearning certain values that were sort of gifted to you or, or, or imposed perhaps upon you when you were younger. I, so I, I sit here from the position of someone who is, in my opinion, early um, in her career. And so there's so much wisdom around me that I feel, you know, this conversation has really allowed me to, to think about in, in ways that I haven't really been challenged or I haven't really been mentored to have these types of thoughts. And I think one um, lesson that I can take even just from hearing both Shaloon and Selena speak is to surround yourself actually with women who can speak about their values very intentionally um, and who can help you to, to speak to, about a narrative in your life to be able to put words to certain emotions that you feel or um, motivations that you have personally within your career. I think even just being able to, to verbalize that um, is so meaningful because we don't often have space to talk about our values and our upbringings and you know the intersection of our values with equity and, and our passions for why we do the things we do. And so just it's been um, it's been so insightful to sort of get this this knowledge and sort of be surrounded by that. I I had a, a slightly strange answer, I suppose, to the question of um, how I have found a way to unlearn my values over time. And I think that there was, um, and I wonder if this is a, a cultural phenomenon, I think it's probably universal, that you're always gonna fight back when you're younger against people sort of telling you what to do. Even if it's for your own good, you don't really understand what that means anyway. And so you're just going to do what you think you believe. And sometimes what you believe is basically just the opposite of what the, uh, the people around you are telling you to believe. So you almost do it to be contrarian. And, and a lot of things were taught to me when I was younger without any, I think the problem was that they were just sort of told to me without any rationale. And actually, as I've gotten older, I have created the rationale for myself and that has made a big difference. So I understand now the things that my grandmother told me were important to be polite, to be kind, to be helpful. My parents always told me to be like a helpful person. And I didn't quite understand that until I got much older and experienced what it was like when others were helpful to me, when my team supported me and had my back, when I had managers and directors who were understanding and who would give me space to just like take a break sometimes and, 
and, and who would give me advice and, and were so generous. Um, and, and then I understood. And so I, I feel like a lot of the things that perhaps it wasn't an unlearning, it was just a, a like a coming to <laughs> in some ways of just sort of these two worlds colliding of what you were told as a child and what you understand now as an adult. To me, I feel like I'm starting to see that bridge form. But again, I'm so, I, really, I do feel, and, and I think even as I get older, I'll still feel so junior and just that I'm beginning to learn. Um, and it's been, it's been meaningful, I suppose, in my own career and in my own life to finally see those two, the past and the present sort of, you know, collide to be able to define how I'm supposed to go about in the future. Um, and so, it, I, yeah, that's sort of my unlearning was just sort of a, like a rebalancing. I, I love the rebalancing framing. And the one thing I'll offer if, it, if it's not evident to everyone is that like, we're all still figuring it out and still expecting to stumble and still, you know, it's that constant learning journey, um, which just felt like something to be explicit about as we um, head on over to Shalu. Yeah, now just in the spirit of, of that, I, I completely resonate with, with your comments, uh, Quinn. Like for me, it's not about unlearning. It's about um, continuously adapting or recalibrating your values with the various situations that unfold in life. And uh, sorry to be so analytical. It's just innate in me. Like I've, I've really thought about those nurture values and nature values as a Venn diagram and the, how much they overlap, you know, uh, constantly changes um, with, with your, with your life. And it shifts depending on what you're faced with and recalibrating that is a way in my perspective um, to balance that tension between what I, think I ought to do and what I want to do. I saw in the chat that a number of us share similar uh, values around loyalty, excellence, honesty, uh, responsibility, and that's a lot of pressure. And as you age and you get more and more responsibilities, um, it's hard to live up to that. And I'm seeing that in the chat as well. And, uh, you know, uh, one advice I would give is, is because we share some of those common values is to apply, apply them to yourself in order for you to be your best self. You know, those same set of values um, you, you need to apply to yourself and, and be good to yourself and, and be true to yourself. So I totally agree. It's not the unlearn your core values. It's more around shifting them or constantly calibrating them. Um, that, that to me is equal to figuring it out. I agree with one of the comments in the chat that age and just life maturity does help. So for those of you who are earlier in your career, being able to be that nimble to shift and to continuously assess whether the job at hand or your career is in line with your values or perhaps it's not, that that gets easier with, with age. And I agree with Quinn, it gets much easier if you share with friends and, and your network. So I encourage, I encourage you to do that. The other one that has often helped me is visualize the future. Like, like all of uh, my friends often make, uh, make fun of me about how much I overthink. And I'm sure a lot of you can resonate with that, but I don't think of it as overthinking. I think of it as like visualizing or daydreaming, not so much what all the accolades I want to achieve or the projects I want to complete or the titles I want to have, but I daydream and visualize what I want to feel. And that's, that's becoming more and more important to me where I'm thinking about, you know, what is it, what is it going to feel like when I fill my cup? And, uh, and so that's another way how I apply my own values to myself. And I think there was a, just because uh, I'm speaking, I think there was a question around like, how do I use my, my values and the ones that we have collective, um, I think, um, commonality and on this team um, in my, my VP role or and to inspire my, my team, or I think I inspire my team um, is, is really, you know, helping them, helping continuously thinking about what's in the best interest for the company and what's in the best interest for the person. 
And, and that is my sense of responsibility and my continuous strive for excellence and truth. Like I'm always kind of asking myself, like, what is it that the business needs? What is it that my, my team member needs and, and how can I help? And, uh, that, that helps me live my, my leadership role. Um, Selena, I'm going to say one other thing that I really loved, and I, I, I wonder if, if you can comment on that if we have time, is that it's really important for us as women to be in that integrated space around what you're good at, what you enjoy, and what you add value. Since you said that to me just even a week ago on our prep call, I was like, yes, that's the calibration that often needs to happen, and in that sweet spot, which happens with time and age and, and uh, chatting with friends and make, constantly recalibrating and visualizing the future, you get to that, that moment of, yeah, I'm doing the right thing. So I'll, I'll just do that quickly. And um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna shamelessly plug uh, my app, which is this, this lesson is I created a, an equity-based leadership development app that's available on Google Play and the app store. I'll put the link in the chat. But in, in lesson six, it's, it talks about us spending most of our lives seeking the next best thing. What's the next best thing? And, you know, why can't we figure out what we do best and do that? And so I've come up with this sort of analogy of where do you find what you do best? And it is where you, what you are good at. So if you put triangles, like answer the questions, what am I good at? And then overlap that with another triangle that says, what do I love? What do I like doing? What do I love doing? And then put another triangle that overlaps in that that says, where can I add value? And that intersection of those three spots is the sweet spot. And probably why it's playing on your mind so much is because I actually, I have the paper version of the app and I actually just did the homework and was able to fill that out a year ago. I've spent my entire life trying to figure out what I'm best at. Again, because you're constantly bombarded by social a society sort of expectations of what you should be doing parents children all these people like ninging at you and then sometimes you think what I'm good at what I wrote here is just like really is this what I'm good at will people take me seriously am I are they're gonna laugh at me but it's what you're good at and so it takes us a while to sort of peel back the layers and actually just be true and honor ourselves what you said at the beginning, honor our dharma, honor the thing that we love, let our passion come through our work. So our work is no longer work, it's just passion. I could quickly comment on that. Um, I think something that I discuss a lot with, um, with my colleagues at work is, I think when you're, when you're younger, you're often motivated to pursue a career in something that you are good at. And you sort of feel like the only thing out there for you is something you're maybe you're not passionate about it, but you're actually just really good at it. And so you're there, you were very strong in the sciences when you went to university. And so you believe that now you're going to become a scientist and you constantly get praised throughout your career that you're really excellent at this job. Um, you know, this is, and, and people keep telling you over and over again, like you, you picked the right field because it really reflects your skill set. And I think where bravery comes in, I suppose, is doing something that you're actually not that good at, but that you really think you could become good at. And I think when you're young, you can take those leaps of faith. And even when you're older at any age, really, of, of you know, not always doing something that you're good at, but just something that makes you feel good. Um, and I think if you are able to do that, you will be successful at it down the line because it will sort of out, you know, it'll sort of out overpower what you're just good at. Um, and that's something I think I've personally experienced in, in just pursuing things that I could do, but didn't really add um, value to my own life. And it's, I suppose, finding the sweet spot of what Selena was talking about, the overlapping of those triangles of getting to where you are good at it, but it really, you know, brings you a lot of joy. Um, without the joy, you can sort of, it's, it's so mechanical to just be good at something. So I think it's a real differentiator. And I think, um, and Selena's app is a is a very structured example of this. And I know that our community loves the structure and and the the applied like what do I do with this inspiration? Um, so thank you for sharing that, Selena. Um, it, it's also like this calibration that Shalu talked about, like 
that you're constantly calibrating those triangles over time. I remember the first time I did an exercise like that, I was like, oh, everything's like outside of the, I use circles, but like everything's outside of it. And I was like, well, that's why I feel so drained and burned out. And then I could start to do something about it. Um, and I'm just going to speak for myself that as I was listening to you, Quinn, about how our tendency is to do something we are good at, it's for me, it's because I want to add value. Like thinking back to that Clayton Christensen essay, like I, I want to leave the world, I want to have an impact and leave the world collectively better than I found it. And for me, when I was younger and still now I'm, I'm on that journey, it feels like, well, there's a, this imperative and urgency to start doing it now. And so then I start with what I know and what I feel like I'm good at. And so part of the unlearning for me has been, um, you know, when I took the role, the leadership role I have now um, at Trillium Health Partners, other scientists had said to me, like, why would you leave a full-time scientific role? And I said, and it, and it felt a little bit uncomfortable um, because I had a lot more autonomy in that full-time scientific role than I have now. But I realized that one of the things I'm good at is helping to develop others and setting them up for success and the impact I can have when I focus outside of myself, not at the expense of myself, but when I, when I um, focus my energy on, on lifting up and developing others is much bigger than the impact I have if all I focus on is my own work. And that's just my truth. But just offering that to you as, as sort of part of the um, journey I've been through it, you know, one of the things that um, I imagine a lot of us, if not all of us share, is that it gets that impact in creating value and, and the visioning exercises, Shalu, to your point, um, when I work on them with people, it's often like, you know, think 20, 30, however many years down the road and like, how do you want to feel and what like everyone that matters in your life is there and what are they saying thank you for um, and sometimes when you get that far away from the now it's easier to connect to that feeling and then work your way back I am mindful of the time and I'm going to um, try to find some of the questions that came up in the chat there was one from Sarah Gilcher that I'll read out um, that I think probably resonates with a lot of you when you find yourself in a work environment that does not align with your values how did you dig deep to find the strength to disrupt? I see Selena smiling and get on a path that brings more joy. Um, and what were some of the enablers to allow you to realign? This is, we're now like completely unstructured. So whoever wants to jump in, feel free and you can build off each other as we go. Yeah, I, I think it's, um... I think in those moments, you know, you you have to really step back and be true to yourself. Um, and um, you, you won't be the best version of yourself if you're not true to yourself. And uh, and I've had moments like that. And luckily, I've worked in places that have been open to hearing how I'm feeling at the time and um, have come forward. I have been open to my suggestions for solutions, but there was one time where that wasn't the case and it took a lot of courage, which is a value I think a lot of us share to, to walk away from that opportunity. Um, and and uh, I think if it had happened in today's time, I probably would have said why I walked away. At that time, I, I just looked for another opportunity and, and left that particular initiative. But um, I think today I would have been a lot more brave to say why. So I think you have to be true to yourself, recalibrate the why, communicate that if they're open to it, um, um, come forward with the solution, don't just come with us with the problem. And if they're open to it, that's great. And if they're not, let, let them know. I 100% I agree. Um, uh, at some point, so my mantra is based on uh, for this question, or my guiding principle for this question is based on Nia Simone's song, you got to know, and you got to know when to leave the table when love is no longer being served. And um, for me, it was 
you know, you dig deep and you and you disrupt, especially when you you know your values are being so compromised. And people would know that, and I'm using my political examples because they're so relevant, but people would know that I decided I wasn't going to run again based on the pattern of behavior that happened when I was in politics, but I decided I was going to sit as an independent based on the SNC scandal. And this is not about Jody or whether you agree or disagree, but the, the problem that I had was that we had come through a Me Too movement where we said, believe her, believe women when they're bullied, believe women when they're harassed, believe her when she says X. And I found it interesting that we could believe her when it was convenient and leave her when it was not. And that I could not, I could not sit with that. I couldn't. And so for me, I couldn't, I could not even dig deep to continue to fight that battle because we were all fighting it. But to, to Shelley's point, the leadership was not understanding where we were coming from. And so it, it made sense to leave. And I left with a lot of pain. But again, I'm not going to read the question, but the pain eventually got to joy. The only other thing that I'll say that I'll add to Shelley's point, if you do decide to stay, is to leverage the power of the village. So instead of us sitting around trying to figure it out on our own or with like a couple of people, there's so many people, there's a, how many people on this call? Like I can't even see anymore. But, uh, you know, over a hundred people when I last looked at that, that were all at its peak on this call and like, connect with them, figure things out, use the quiet ones, use the disruptors. You don't say, I don't like Selena because she's too loud, or I don't like that one because they're too, they're too quiet, or that one is too process driven. We, there's a process of disruption that involves all of us. And it could only be successful if we engage all of us and don't start disconnecting and fragmenting ourselves to save ourselves. It doesn't make sense. And so I think that joy is found through connection but it's also found through understanding that we are better together than we are separate. I was going to add very quickly to what um, Shalou and Selena were saying. And as they were, as they were speaking, I thought about, I think leaving something, the, the concept of, of leaving something is so, can feel so lonely because then you are sort of on your own. And it just sort of, sort of made me think about, reframing that as you know when like this common phrase of when one door closes another opens and I really do think you need to remove yourself from these environments where you are not thriving and move to somewhere else where you will and it is less about sort of this sense of abandonment or being or just sort of leaving behind the past but this is just a new chapter for you you're just moving on um, instead of sort of you know leaving something behind and and I found that framing helpful for me because of this this influence that I suppose like my elders and those who are in positions of power have always had on me to not want to disappoint and to not want to let them down by leaving and then you just at the end of the day have to make a conscious decision that surely these people do not want you to be miserable forever and so you must move on um, it's so in in sort of pleasing them ideally their intentions are with you know with your best interests in mind it's it's just time to, to move on and move forward um and seeing things like i always try to see life as just you need to keep going um and not stagnate and stay still in, in a place where you can't thrive um so much about this resonates and i think um what i'll offer as a as a framing is that i always try to think like what's within my control and what assumptions am I holding about this? And this is like a very scientific way of framing it, but I'm like, okay, let's test that assumption. So I'm assuming this can't change. Have I asked, have I, have I told anyone, you know, what's bothering me or how I feel? And I'll use the example of the pandemic um, where I've had team members say like, they're so burnt out. And I'm like, great, not great. But I'm like, now that we know, like, what do we need? Let's, they're like, I think I need a day off. And I'm like, take three. Like, let's actually create the space you need, because if you think you need a day and it's, it's taken it till this point to realize um, we need to create space. And, and that's, that's the power that I have as a leader, but as an individual, so if we flip those roles, I need to speak up. I need to be able, as a leader, I can create safe spaces, but as an individual, even to my leaders, this is too much. Um, you know, I, I need to, especially in our virtual world right now, 
be able to articulate what it is, reflect on and articulate what's creating that pressure, um, to give an opportunity to see um, where there is movement or evolution, recognizing that to, to be healthcare specific for a moment, that that change sometimes take time takes time. That is not an excuse for, you know, give us five years and we'll start to address racism. Um, it, but it is an acknowledgement of let's have a transparent conversation about our limitations. Um, so, so to be very tactical for a moment, if you're going to somebody um, you report to or someone that has a more senior position in the organization, you could say, I appreciate there may be pressures I'm unaware of here, but I'd like to discuss the pressures that I'm feeling and, and work with you to see where there's flexibility to alleviate some of that pressure. Um, similarly, if you're a leader, you can work within your teams to say, you know, I only know what I can see right now. And so I want to create the space for you to bring forward the things that I can't see or the pressures that I don't have a line of sight on. Um, and, and we can perhaps follow up later about the tactics there, but I think um, the bottom line for me is don't make assumptions if you're in an environment where there's a values conflict, that that is the status quo and that it is, that is the stable state. I think I have unnecessarily went through some pain by making that assumption and not, um, not opening it up to others, whether it's peers to help me think through it or those that I work with, to realize that actually this doesn't need to be the way it is. I just assumed that I didn't have the power to do anything about it. Um, we're at, I don't see, oh, there we go. Thanks, Zoe, um, right on time. So one question for the group as we come into our final minutes um, is, if you have recommendations for value-driven mentoring programs for women in science, because women who lead mentoring program, we have talked about building a mentoring program for a while. Um, great suggestion. I think here, here's where I, I'm going to leave it very wide open, which I feel like I, I'm going to need to put into the chat for Quinn um, to, to tease a little bit. So I think as we close, what I'll ask the panelists to do is you can either share your parting thought you can pick up on the sort of mentorship um, note that was just in the chat, but just some, something you want to leave um, our participants with today around the topic or, or your thinking or any, any pearl that you feel like sharing. Um, let's start with Shalu, not to put you on the spot, but. No problem. I, you know, just been reflecting on this last half of our of our conversation and all the tensions that we're balancing of our values, nurture, nature, what we expect of each other. And I, you know, one thing I've, I've also valued um, with how modernization is happening is the importance of communication. And I think if you share your values, you, you people will speak to you with with knowing what your values are. And if you give passion, you will get passion back. And, uh, and so, you know, that, that saying around, like, put it out there in the universe, I think that can't be any more important now with allowing, uh, with the transparency, social media, networks, mentoring sessions out there, and even relationships with your bosses. Things have changed quite a bit. And I think it's onus on us to share our values um, with our networks, with our bosses, with our team members, um, so that they speak to you and can try to resonate with you. And I think you have to give passion to get passion uh, back in our careers and our home lives and with our networks. Um, Quinn, we're going to come to you because I, not to put pressure, I just feel like Selena's going to leave us with something profound. So we'll work our way there. I agree with that as well. I the comment that was made around mentorship um, in the chat, you know, I was just looking sort of through the names of who the people on this on this call, Carolyn Still Gray is here, Ram Stremler, who I've worked with, Laura yourself, like there are so many women who I think not on not even in, they probably didn't know that they were doing this, have been mentors to me throughout my career, who have just sort of showed up and made an impact and allowed other women to see themselves and, and who they could become 
um, by having that example be put out there. And I think you can definitely live your values just through the work that you do. You don't even have to you don't even have to sometimes be so explicit as to say it in a forum like this. You know, I think your actions can speak so loudly and, and the work that you put out there and the value that you contribute, those things really speak to, you know, who you are as a person. And so I I hope that for, for all of you that you're able to see yourselves as both mentors to others, which I have tried to, to become to my own team, but really mentees. Um, to all those who have sort of come before us and to soak in that wisdom, which I've really been doing this whole call. Um, and so the, the value of mentorship, I think, and, and sort of embodying those values and seeing others, you know, live their own truths. It, it's been um, a, a major sort of, um, you know, moment of joy in my own career. So just wanted to end there. Uh -huh. I'll just jump in and say to Zoe, Zoe, um, everything that that has been said about mentorship is absolutely true. What um, we often look for mentors who look like us, but I've been mentored by some of the greatest people who are totally opposite to me and see things in me that I never see that I didn't see in myself. And so um, it's it is kind of like a mentorship app, but if you download the app, Quinn, I'll go on the back end. And, uh, sorry. As Zoe, go on the back end and give you free access uh, to the entire app so you could read my words and I could mentor you through the app. But I will close with um, something that I usually say to my mom, which she's like, don't say that. It's so terrible. And I live my life um, in a way that my tombstone will say that all she had left to do was die. I live every single day. And I think in that living, we, we create those or we get those, we solidify those values. We create the empathy that is required to have those courageous moments where we could stand up in truth and justice, not just for others, but in particular for ourselves. And so I would encourage everyone on the call, and I don't know anybody's age, but to live, to kiss frogs, to eat fine food and to tell your story of doing that, because in telling our stories, in creating that inclusive environment where we talk to one another, we will be able to put back together the frayed threads of humanity that have been lost, especially over the last couple of years. So I'll leave it with that and say thank you. Namaste to each and every one of you for being here this afternoon. Um, thank you so much to each one of you and and I feel like this this is like a an awkward moment of transparency that I think will will land with some of you um after we knew Selena was going to join us today um I read her book and I feel like this is going somewhere I promise I feel like I know her so much better than just you know this 90 minutes and a half hour we had before and the reason I share that um as I like toned down my fangirl moment is, is to, to, to say to you that like, it's not always visible to you, the impact you're having and the example you're setting. Um, and, you know, even for our panelists today, um, there will be individuals who listen to this later and benefit from this conversation, although they weren't here in real time. There's examples that you set by the way you show up and the way that you speak um, that have ripple effects far beyond um, far beyond your sort of vantage point. And, and I'll offer that when we were talking about visioning before, um, for me, like that's part of what I want at the, at the end of my life is to that, that sense of it went farther than I can see um, and farther than I intended. I didn't need to control that. It happened organically. Um, so thank you to all of you. This was, um, for me personally, better than I could have ever imagined. Um, definitely filled my cup at a time when I feel like a lot of us could use more than that. Um, so please know that, that on behalf of this group, we are grateful for the time that you took to connect with us today um, and grateful for the examples that you have set and will continue to set um, in your lives as you move forward. So thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Wednesday. And looking forward to connecting with you all again. Thanks, everyone.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Laura. Bye. The whole team.